Hi, so today I'm going to be talking about environmental sustainability and app development. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about your motivations for following sustainability. Then I'm going to get into a little bit of the sustainability theory. And then I'm going to talk about how you can quantify the impact of your app. And then I'll give you some general advice to follow before you start quantifying your impact. So I started as a dev and later moved into a Masters of Sustainable Built Environment, which is studying the sustainability of cities. So I do a lot of architecture, planning, infrastructure type things. And this is me essentially trying to shove all that learning into the stuff that I did before. So there's not a lot of actual stuff people do in sustainability of software. So I'm pretty much making this up. So if, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, but I think it's a good starting point. So first off, I want to motivate you to be more sustainable. I want you all to think of your dream technological advancement. So this is like 50 years in the future, you want to go to Mars, you want to have like a giant mech suit, that sort of thing. Just have a moment, think about that. Think about how cool that is. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, so how does the environment impact that? First off, we are facing global warming. Once we start getting a temperature rise, we are going to lose our ability to produce food properly. And when we lose that, our society falls apart. We don't have food, we have riots, we have war. And if we have riots and war, we do not have the resources to innovate. These things will never happen. So you really should care about the environment. And you should care about it now, not in 20 years when we have problems. So the real question is, for us, is technology the problem or the solution? There are lots of different schools of thought about this. And the two I sort of want to talk about are ecological modernization and risk society. So ecological modernization says, as we advance, we'll just naturally become more efficient and these problems will go away. And this is sort of rests on the theory that it's not capitalism that is the problem, it's industrialization. And as we advance, this, this will just fix itself. Like, we'll just move away from that. Everything will be happy, there'll be bunnies and rainbows, etc. But risk society says, that we function in a society of risk that we have manufactured ourselves. And a lot of this risk we didn't realise we were manufacturing until years down the track when we suddenly turned around and went, holy crap, <laughs> that's a big problem. So we're not perfect. We don't understand the problems that we are creating in modernising. So there's these two theories. Either modernising is going to make everything great or it is just going to really ruin everything. And I think we need a balance between the two. We need to modernise where it will make a difference and demodernise where we can, just to remove our impacts. And I think in software, we have a huge problem because it's a virtual thing. It's not tangible. We don't think about its impacts at all because it doesn't exist. But we do have a lot of impact. This research from Greenpeace, I think it was 2007, so it's a little bit old now, but at that point, the cloud used enough energy to rank as a country. And it ranked sixth. So that is a lot of energy that is being used every day that we have the power to reduce. So Apple is doing a lot for us at the moment. They're really on the sustainability bandwagon at the moment. And they got top marks from Greenpeace last year. So they're using 100% renewable in their cloud technologies. And they got A's for transparency. And if you want to look at any of their reports, they're all at this website here. So apple.com slash AU environment. And they have lots, lots of different tech sheets for all the different devices going back years and years. Though for some reason, I couldn't find the 5S. It's just gone. <laughs> so there's lots of different tech sheets. They're good to look at just to understand sort of what you're working with. And I really think that apps have power. Like, I know people who have taken phones back to the shop because it didn't have Instagram. Like, we can shape what people are buying, what people are doing, and if we refuse to support things that are bad, then the industry will become better. 
So I've said sustainability a lot, and generally it's a little bit hand wavy, but the UN defines it as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we have to give back what we take, essentially. But when you're talking to someone in the sustainability biz, they're normally talking about the triple bottom line. So this is a theory with that within capitalism, sustainability is a function of three things. That's people, planet, and profit. And there's lots of intersections between these things. And we have to work to optimize all these things. And when we have optimized all of them, then that is sustainability. So within people, this is like the social issues, fair work practices, that sort of thing. Not like destroying communities with your horrible factories. That's not really a problem for us, but you know, if you're producing your app-themed socks, then maybe, maybe you need to think about that sort of thing. But generally within our businesses, like tech startups, we understand the social, like, you know, giving people things so that they work for you to raise your economic value. Planet is all your environmental issues, and there's lots of different variety in the things that come under this banner. And for us, we're really going to be looking at energy. And some of the other things might come in, depending on what your app does. And profit. So this is the one everyone pretty much understands. Like, this is, this is the one we're sort of brought up to think, you know, you have a business, it's for profit. <laughs> like, everyone understands that. Sometimes you'll see the triple bottom line represented like this. That is to sort of demonstrate that the environment is the most important circle. Without the environment, we don't have a society, then we don't have an economy. So you need to work on the environment first. That's most important. But a lot of the time, we see this. And we're building our pyramid from the economy up. And that's bad, because this is not sustainable and will eventually break. So. What, when I talk about sus sustainability in the environment, we're talking about this point right here. You're not causing degeneration or regeneration. And there's a lot of words that are thrown around around this. A lot of the ones, like business as usual, this is the practices that are happening right now. There's a lot of other words for sustainability, like net zero, carbon neutral, things like that. And particularly when there's like an identifier like carbon neutral, that doesn't mean it's sustainable. It's only sustainable for carbon. But there are lots of other words that get thrown around that can fall anywhere on this scale. They're meaningless, essentially. Don't trust things that say they're environmentally friendly. They could be worse than business as usual. They can say whatever they like. So the first thing we have to do when we want to become more sustainable is actually measure what our impacts are. If you don't measure, you don't know, and you're going to make assumptions, which will be wrong. And there's really two common ways of doing this. There's carbon footprinting, which everyone sort of is fairly used to, and then there's life cycle analysis. And that's the one I'm going to focus on today, because I think carbon footprints, which give you a land value for, for products, aren't necessarily very applicable to something that's virtual. So what is a life cycle analysis? Life cycle analysis focuses on incorporating all the impacts from the cradle to the grave and then encouraging people to remove the grave altogether. So you want to create a product that goes from cradle to cradle. And it sort of works from the principle that in nature there is no waste. Waste is a human construct. And you can do this for the other circles in the triple bottom line. And their social life cycle analysis and life cycle costing, and there'll be some links at the end if you're interested in those sorts of things. So there's four steps in a life cycle analysis. Scoping, taking inventory, analyzing your impacts, and then interpreting. So within scoping, you really need to decide what exactly it is you're analyzing. And then the boundaries that you're going to include, what you're going to exclude. The allocation of responsibility. And this is really tricky because there's a lot of responsibility to go around. And deciding what is yours and what is someone else's is hard. The different areas of concern, so this is like energy, toxins, things like that. And any assumptions and limitations that you are going to make. Because you are going to be making them. 
So in terms of what, you have lots of different things that are working within your app. So you have your product, your business, your work site, and the individuals who work there. And there's lots of overlaps between them. So it can get a little bit murky. And sometimes it helps to do a couple of these at a time just so you can sort of glob it all together and then squish it out. <laughs> that makes sense. So we're going to set some boundaries for an app. There's the cradle, which is the development phase. And then sometimes you find people will advertise cradle to gate lifecycle analysis. So that's just one little slice of the life cycle. So you can have cradle to grave, cradle to cradle, cradle to gate, gate to gate, that sort of thing. <laughs> then you have the market. So this will be the app store. You have another gate. Then you have the use of your app. And then you have the grave. So at some point, people are going to delete your app. You have to make sure that it's dead. Don't leave things hanging on. And don't forget that there's transport in between these phases. And then you need to allocate responsibility for these. At the development phase, is it the responsibility of your product, your business, the site, or the individual? At the market, is it is it the responsibility of Apple or is it the responsibility of you? At this point, I think it's probably Apple. They, they give you no control over that sort of thing. So they can have that one. At use, are the usages the user's fault, your service provider's fault, or your fault? And again, at the grave, I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what's going on there. But you, know, you have to think about who all the players are and who the impacts belong to. And most importantly, this is where you get brownie points. Externalities are the side effects of your product. These are the things that aren't belonging to anyone. So for instance, when we talk about buildings, a lot of the time transport to the building is an externality. So you don't necessarily control how people get to your location but you can set up in a way that encourages people to do it properly. So take public transport, ride a bike, that sort of thing. So you can change those things with an app. You know, this is going to be your UX things, things that you're encouraging your user to do, whether you're meaning to or not. Uh, for instance, with Pokemon Go, you're meant to walk around and find Pokemon, but some people drive. And that's not necessarily your responsibility but you can influence that. And you get lots of brownie points for internalizing your externalities. These are the things that you want to do to know that you're doing this properly. So there's lots of different types of impacts. For an app, you're probably going to want to just start with energy. But as you sort of start looking in depth at what's going on, then you'll probably find other factors that you can include. And the next step is taking inventory. So this is just looking at everything and giving it a value. So for energy, you're saying, you know, we use this amount of kilowatt hours or, for example, we have got the material use for the iPhone 6S. So this is in the Apple Docs. It has values like grams, you know, like 25 grams of aluminium. So this is just noting exactly what's there and what's happening. And then you want to quantify this. So actually go in, find the impact with like locations. It's going to be tricky because different locations have different impacts for energy depending on how it's generated. So like th this isn't easy. And a lot of the time you have to generalize and say, well, it's sort of like this. So we think it's this. And with all the different categories, you want to change this into a common metric. Normally, it's a CO2 equivalent. So normally kilograms, that sort of thing. So that you can compare everything and know exactly what your impact is in one big blob. And then you have to interpret it. You have to decide what's acceptable. And remembering that sustainability is having no impact. So if you're having any impact at all, then that's too much. And then find your biggest impacts and the ones that are easiest to reduce. These are the low hanging fruit. And you go for these because they give you lots of good feelings because you can get it done and it reduces the number quickly. And really, you have to acknowledge the problems with your analysis. If you generalized anything, if there's anything in there that's an assumption, just say, you know, we fudged this a bit. We think it's right, 
but you know we could possibly do better even than the numbers say. So there's a lot of issues with LCA. It requires transparency from all parties. If you're working with a service provider, they may not tell you anything. And that probably tells you you should go with a different service provider. But, and all the generalizations and the fact that there are standards, but it's not really standardized, means that you cannot really compare to lifecycle analysis. For instance, we have uh, analysis of a Dell desktop and an iMac. And looking at it, it's like it's in the same value, like you get the same sort of picture, but you don't know what Dell did to get that value and you don't know what Apple did to get that value. And often we say you can't compare apples and oranges. In this case, you can't compare apples and Dells. <laughs> like, as a consumer, you don't know if these values are equal or not. And just for a start, I know that Dell uses a three-year life cycle for their computers and Apple uses four. I don't know if anyone's actually ever had an Apple product for four years. Oh yeah, look at that. You're all so good. Reduce, that's the first step. <laughs> so as I was doing this, I found a few interesting things that with the application of the LCA to an app. Development and apps, like with a normal product you have, you make it, you sell it. It has a definite production impact. But with an app, you have one production and then you could just spew out as many of those as you like, as many as people want to download. So allocating the development impact is really hard. Do you divide it by the number of, of users or does that impact belong to every user? And also, the development impact is always growing. Because it's an iterative process, you're always just adding to that impact. So unless you can figure out some way to say, this little piece of code is no longer in there, the development impact of that no longer applies, which is going to require a lot of actual planning before you start. <laughs> I'm not sure it's entirely applicable, but it's a good place to start just to say, you know, we have roughly this sort of impact. We're going to work to fix it. And once you've done all this, once you've pushed as hard as you can for sustainability, and due to the nature of this business, you need to offset. Because I, I'm not entirely sure that an app can be neutral. <laughs> like, we're always going to have a little bit of energy use, I think. So you do eventually probably need to offset. But I would say use this as a last option. Like, don't. Don't go for offsetting, just be like, eh, we'll just pay for it. Don't, don't be like that. Try and fix your impacts first. I mean, if you just want to be philanthropic, go for it. But fix your impacts before you try to offset. And when you do offset, make sure you're offsetting the right factors. So if your sock factory is making toxins, don't offset on carbon. If you have a carbon problem, don't offset on toxins. And choose something that's applicable to your company, to your users. Something that's meaningful. Something that you're actually wanting to give value back to. Don't just throw money at the carbon neutral company and be like, eh, wherever you like. Because then you don't really care. So it doesn't create any sort of meaning. So a few general sustainability rules for you to follow. First up, always optimize. Like, everyone knows that they should optimize and you're like, yeah, we'll just, we'll fix that later. Really fix it now because little problems now become big problems later. And we have a, a saying in the sustainability business, the most sustainable something is the something you don't make. So the most sustainable building is the building you don't build. The most sustainable app is the app you don't make. So don't build unnecessary things, you know. <laughs> If it's not needed, then don't. And plan for growth, because if you don't, then that small problem that you were like, eh, it's only a small problem, suddenly becomes multiplied by millions of users, and you have a big problem. And even if it's easy to fix, there was still that impact while that problem existed. And create environmental policies and make them core to your business. Say, we are functioning under a triple bottom line. Environment is just as important as profit. Think about your emergent behaviours, your UX, all those little side effects. Make them your responsibility. Fix them. And measure to manage. Don't make assumptions. If you make assumptions, you'll be wrong. 
there's a really good TED talk that I haven't actually linked and I'll probably tweet it later about the different assumptions that we make and how they're wrong. It like compares sponges and paper towels and things like that. It's quite informative. And where it's impossible to reduce, then offset, but always try to reduce first. And ensure that others know about your environmental policies. And if you make a decision because of an environmental thing, tell people. Say, we didn't go with this because it wasn't environmentally sound. This is important to us. Because the only way to push our industry forward is to make it important. And if we make it important, then it becomes important to others. And without making it important, we don't have a future. Like, our technological dreams, they end here. So always remember, the power is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So the question was, whereabouts exactly are we measuring these impacts? And the answer is, is like all of it. It does require a lot of work, and you do have to like go and figure out how many users you have, where they are, how long they spend on your app. So the time, I think Xcode has some like interface, interface or something. it has some tools to measure battery usage and things like that. So you really need to investigate those things see how much energy your app is using, how much time you're spending developing things, like if you're just sitting there letting your computer run, like that's, that's not good practice, that sort of thing. And most of the time you will have to generalise a little bit. Yes? Well, the question was how do we sort of make people think about things that are just running in the background, like people don't think about their servers, things like that. And the answer is you just have to start thinking about it yourself and telling people that you're thinking about it and that it matters. Like, it, it's all the small steps. I know sometimes it feels like really, like, not, not useful, like, this is, this is useless, why am I telling people about this? They don't care. But the more you talk about it, the more normal it becomes, like, all it takes is sort of like one company to start pushing and then others will follow. I hope. <laughs> yes? Um, so, with, um, so I was thinking about this um, before, you know, like before this as well. But um, I was wondering, would um, building apps for more operating systems, like say, for all the versions of iPhones or Macs, would So the question was, build, does building for multiple platforms affect the sustainability? And I think you're going to have to investigate all the platforms and see if there's different performances. Like, an iMac has a worse performance than a Dell. Sorry, it's full of aluminium. <laughs> it, that's the nature of, of Apple. And you know, if that's not acceptable to you, then don't develop for that platform and say, I'm not developing for Apple. They're using all these precious metals. It's not, it's not worth it. I would prefer you use something else. And so I guess the, like, another part of my question was by um, making the devices not obsolete, by making ah. more apps available to the, to the users with older phones, hopefully they wouldn't throw it away yeah. um, because now there's more apps that you can actually do. Yeah, so you're asking about obsolescence and is using an older product better than buying a new one? And Again, this is, falls back to those sort of assumptions. Like you might assume that it's better to keep someone using an older phone 
or an older computer, but it may be better for them to buy a new one. And I'm not really sure entirely how that works for everything. And again, we still need to investigate these things. Like, no one knows the answer. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, what is low-hanging fruit? So the low-hanging fruit is the easy things. So if you think of a fruit tree, they're the easy things to, to sort of grab. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not entirely sure without like an app in front of me. Like for, for different people, it'll be different things. Like you might have lots of things in your app that were poorly made and it's really easy to fix them. So it might be that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, see, that is a really good suggestion. Halve your laptops using pair programming. <laughs> Yeah, so for apps, energy is, is probably going to be the big one. <laughs> yep, that's right. No, no being silly on the computer anymore. That uses energy. <laughs> mm, and that comes back to assigning responsibility. Like, is that usage the responsibility of the individual? Is that just part of their, their life cycle or is it part of your product now that it's been done at work? Yeah, so in terms of research, there wasn't a whole lot that I could find, and the stuff that I did find seemed a little bit wonky to me, like they were looking at the way developers got to work and things like that, and I don't really think that's part of the product. But it's also really hard to search for, because if you search for software and any of these terms, then you just get software that does these things. So my, my Google Foo was a bit weak when I was looking for it, but there are the occasional things that I find. But if anyone knows of any certifications or things like that for software, I would really love to know about that. Or if you do find a good paper, because I'd like to find out if people are doing things. I haven't been able to find it. Cool. Thank you.